Welcome back to The Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by John Light to discuss the novel introduction of validity proofs to Bitcoin. We talk about how a good increase of mining fee revenues for Bitcoin miners, the cost for economic full nodes, and if there's a silver bullet solution for scaling Bitcoin. John, welcome to The Mining Pod. Thank you so much for your time. I'm, I'm really excited for today's conversation. Basically, going back to your report that you published a few months ago now about how validity proofs or ZK rolls uh, is the more general term, I suppose, that a lot of people have been using incorrectly, uh, uh, how they could be used for Bitcoin and what they mean for Bitcoin mining. Uh, there's a lot of implications for Bitcoin miners who are definitely uh, needing some re- more revenue right now. But again, thank you for joining the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, so we'll dive into it. Uh, first, if we could actually just give a little recap on yourself and your uh, your story as it pertains to ZK Rollups and Validity Proofs. I know that you worked with the Human Rights Foundation to make this report, so maybe give the audience a little context for that before we go a little further into the conversation. Yeah, sure. So the Human Rights Foundation published a call for proposals at the beginning of 2022 asking for people to submit their proposals for producing a report about validity rollups or zk rollups on bitcoin um the uh the recipient of uh the grant or you know the winning proposal would get a grant uh for one bitcoin to produce this report over a four month uh, fellowship, and it was co-sponsored by S- Starkware and uh, CMS Holdings. And I have a background in researching Bitcoin cross-chain protocols and scaling protocols, um, things like side chains, atomic swaps, and rollups. And so, I thought I could use my existing knowledge to contribute to this report. And so I submitted an application and ended up getting uh, the fellowship. And so for four months last year, I spent some time doing research, interviewing a lot of other researchers, engineers, and other experts in the field um, who are working on either validity rollups directly or adjacent problems. And at the end of it, um, had, had this report, shared it with the community. I've been getting a lot of, uh, great feedback, uh, from people. And, um, now I'm at the point where, you know, I'm just trying to educate the community about the, the potential and, and I'm really glad for opportunities like this to, to speak to, um, the mining community and anyone else who happens to watch this show. Awesome. Yeah, this report was definitely uh, well accepted by the community, which is funny because a lot of times Bitcoiners are not always the ones who want to see some sort of, um, I would say, like changes to Bitcoin. A lot of fans of ossification out there, it seems these days. So I was pretty impressed by uh, people accepting this report when it first came out. But let's first define the problem for Bitcoin and then talk about what uh, zero knowledge rollups on top of Bitcoin could do. Uh, but yeah, I hand it back to you. What's the problem that we're trying to fix for Bitcoin? When it comes to validity rollups, I think there are actually a number of different problems that this touches on. Um, one of those problems is scaling. So like, how do we support more users of Bitcoin um, without increasing the burden on full nodes or miners? Um, another problem is extensibility which is basically a fancy word of saying like how do we add more features to bitcoin so people can um, do more different types of transactions or um, secure their bitcoin in 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 different types of ways than bitcoin um, currently supports and uh, you know you can look at a subset of that um, there's kind of you know this this persistent problem with Bitcoin since the beginning of, of privacy, where um, you know it's because 
all of the Bitcoin transactions are public, the metadata about the transactions is public. Um, once you kind of connect somebody's uh, identity to a Bitcoin address, it becomes pretty easy to like follow their activity around the blockchain um, and, and maybe even figure out like how much money they have, who they're doing business with and things like that. Um, and so privacy, you can think of as like a subset of like the larger group of uh, features that maybe we would want to add to Bitcoin or, or improve on Bitcoin. Um, but there are a lot of other things that people want to do with their Bitcoins to like um, new kinds of self-custodial schemes using like vault technology or covenants, different types of smart contracts, like some of the things you're seeing on other blockchains with peer-to-peer uh, -peer finance. Um, and so when, when, when we ask ourselves about extensibility, it's really about just you know, being able to do more with your Bitcoin or, or have more features um, and things that you can, uh, different kinds of ways that you can use your Bitcoin. So those are some of the problems that somewhat amazingly like validity rollups can address kind of all at the same time. It's not a silver bullet and we'll kind of get into some of the limitations, um, but but it is a quite powerful technology in that it, it is able to at least make some forward progress on, on those problems. Yeah, thanks for the quick explanation there. It was pretty succinct. Let's talk about uh, validity proofs themselves. And um, as we were just talking about before the show, ZK rollups are a subset of validity proofs. Maybe just back up the truck a little bit for our entire audience, which probably isn't very familiar with this sort of uh, solution for scaling blockchains. Yeah, so a validity rollup is a blockchain that has a strong connection to a parent blockchain. So in this context, Bitcoin would be the parent blockchain, and then you could build a rollup that is another blockchain that has a strong connection to Bitcoin. And what that strong connection gives you is a secure bridge so that you could transfer Bitcoins from the main chain to the rollup and then back to Bitcoin um, securely like with full kind of self-custodial security, just as if you own the coins on, you know, Bitcoin layer one. And then uh, another uh, feature that you get out of the rollup protocol is that it uh, the rollup fully inherits the double spend security of Bitcoin layer one transactions. So once a rollup transaction gets confirmed, in a, a, a layer one block or in, in a Bitcoin block, um, you have to actually reorg that Bitcoin block in order to reorg the, the rollup transaction. So it's just as secure from a double spend perspective as any transaction that you would make on layer one. So with those two features combined, the like secure bridge between Bitcoin and the rollup and the full inheritance of uh, layer one double spend security, what you get is a security model where owning coins and transferring or receiving coins on the rollup is equally secure to owning coins, transferring and receiving coins on layer one. The magic comes from the validity proof, which is a cryptographic proof uh, that proves the validity of all of the transactions that are happening in the rollup, um, similar to the way that a digital signature, when you sign a Bitcoin transaction, proves that you own the private keys without having to reveal the private key. Um, you can actually have this validity proof that proves the validity of the transactions that are happening in this other uh, blockchain without um, the whoever's verifying the proof, in this case, uh, layer one full nodes and, and Bitcoin miners, having to actually rerun all of the computation to execute those transactions and, you know, kind of like manually verify those transactions one at a time. They just have to verify this single validity proof that gets posted onto layer one along with um, some data about the transactions that was in the, the roll-up block. 
So, you know, you can basically have some transactions that happen over on this rollup. A rollup block producer will bundle those transactions into a block and then produce a validity proof that shows that, you know, all of the transactions in this block are conforming to the validity rollup protocol as well as the Bitcoin protocol itself. And then the, you know, that, that bundle of transactions and the validity proof gets posted to layer one. And then layer one full nodes will will store the data about the transactions and then just verify that the validity proof is actually valid. And if it, it's valid, then it gets accepted and, and miners can safely include that in their block. And um and then you know the 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 process proceeds for the next roll of block and the next roll of block after that. So it's kind of like a it's a blockchain that's like running parallel to Bitcoin. Every so often the block producers can do this kind of you can think of it almost like a checkpoint process but it's really a confirmation process of confirming blocks into um, layer one bitcoin blocks unlike side chains where you have you know the data is stored off chain and and bitcoin full nodes aren't doing any kind of verification of the transactions that are happening there instead you 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 have layer one full nodes that are validating through the validity proof, all of the transactions that are happening over there. And that's how you're able to get that full security um, between Bitcoin and, and the rollup. You've practiced this a few times because your your pitch is perfect. Uh, you're really being so succinct here. I appreciate that. A uh, few follow-up questions on this in terms of like the architecture for it. The only knowledge I have it is really from Ethereum land where they have developed a lot of different rollups, whether it be optimistic or zero knowledge. A lot of times they have like their own node set up and then those nodes push things to the main chain. What sort of changes would be made for Bitcoin in order to allow this architecture to work? And would you have to run a full like roll up node somewhere else? Or would this be able to all roll completely through a Bitcoin node? Or would a, a company have to run like a, a, a roll up server? What would that sort of look like? Well, the design space for roll ups is pretty broad, similar to any other kind of blockchain. Um, so you could have a rollup that's run by a single node. You could have rollups that are run by multiple nodes that have some sort of, you know, consensus protocol between them to decide who actually gets the right to produce a, a block. Um, it's yeah, the, the design space is, I would say, um, fairly open. Um, but you would have at least some changes to Bitcoin layer one to enable the validity rollup protocol. So um, you would add changes to Bitcoin, enough changes that you could actually build the roll the rollup smart contract or script, which would actually hold the funds that people move into the rollup. And then you would also need to add some logic for verifying the validity proof that gets posted back to layer one by um, the rollup block producers so that layer one full nodes can, can know how to actually verify that validity proof and ensure the security of those transactions. And um, yeah, beyond that, it's like I said, the design space is fairly open in terms of how you actually want to build your rollup. Um, it just depends on maybe the application as well as like the preferences of the users, what the market wants, that kind of uh, what stage of development the rollup might be in, you know, that kind of thing. Gotcha. Appreciate that. So let's talk about nomenclature for a second before turning over to mining. Uh, in your report itself, which we'll for sure link in today's show notes, you talk about the scaling improvements versus throughput. And this is the idea going back to James Presswich in like 2020. And I mean, it's been in like roll up discourse, I should say. And I don't even know if that's a term, but I'll, I'll use it now. Uh, roll up discourse for a little bit. The idea that like just because you're able to add more transactions to a blockchain through a second layer doesn't mean that you're scaling it, it just means that you're in increasing throughput. And the idea behind that is more about the hardware cost, right? So what you just mentioned there was like you could have a lot of different architectures for different roll designs. And if you're using a server to process all these rollups, then you're not really increasing scaling for individual blockchain 
you're increasing the throughput because you're adding more hardware on top of it. And I want to like just get your thoughts on that. Uh, maybe you can define a little bit better than I have than just right there or summarize it a little bit better than I have. What's your thought on like scaling Bitcoin versus increasing the throughput of Bitcoin? Yeah, so the way that I think about this um, is that scaling means that you're able to increase the number of transactions that is possible, but you're, or you can just call it throughput maybe. You can increase the throughput without increasing your cost of validation. Um, and so you're able to support more transactions on the same hardware for, you know, roughly the same cost or, or that, you know, it, maybe you can increase your transactions, you know, by 10 X or hundred X and only increase your costs by like two X, um, like that, that would be a pretty good trade-off. But if you have like this linear relationship between increases in throughput and increases in cost, um, you know, some scaling people would say like, that's not really scaling. You're just, you're just adding more costs. Um, which is in, in computer science, it's, it's like the, the brute force way of like scaling a system. It's just add more computers. Um, and it can, you can do more things. Um, but in the Bitcoin context, just adding more computers means making the process of participating as a full node more expensive, which raises the barrier to running a full node, which, uh, means that fewer people can do it, which over time centralizes the network into those, the hands of those fewer and fewer people who can actually validate that the rules are being followed. Um, or in the case of mining, actually like mine competitively. Gotcha. Well, let's move over to mining, which our audience I'm sure has been waiting with a bated breath to talk about. Miners right now are suffering from really low hash price. If you look at fees as well, fees are basically all time lows. Again, the chart I saw, and someone can correct me in the comments if I'm wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure I saw this yesterday, uh, was that fees were the lowest in 2022 for Bitcoin than they ever have been when price in Satoshi. So like, it's tough being a miner when you're looking at fees because you'd, you'd want to get some fee revenue, but it's not really happening. And scaling solutions are interesting or throughput solutions even just because you can have more applications on top of Bitcoin or more transactions at the very least and then increase the amount of fees going to the base layer. Or at least that's one idea that's been talked about with like Lightning and Starkware and things of that nature. So I want to throw the question over to you. Talk about uh, mining and Bitcoin, uh, mining and uh, ZK Bruce. How do these things interact and what are your expectations for of mining revenue. Would this even help mining revenue? Yeah, I do think that validity rollups um, could could help um, mining revenue. And I think it helps in two different ways. One is that um, validity rollups enable more throughput. So it does enable more Bitcoin or uh, more transactions that have Bitcoin level of security and self-custody as I described earlier, um, in my report, which is at bitcoinrollups.org, if anyone wants to dig into the numbers that I'm about to talk about, um, I show how, um, under certain assumptions without actually raising the block weight limit at all, we could fit, um, approximately 250,000 transactions per block. If like a validity rollup block were to take up you know, all of the space, all of the available space within our current 4 million weight unit um, limit. And that is approximately 100 times more than the average number of transactions that you know is in any given block that you'll look at on the blockchain today. Um, I think the actual limit is closer to like 2000 or not limit, but the actual average is closer to around 2000 transactions per block, but you'll occasionally see some, some blocks that go up to like 2,500 or, or thereabouts. I think, you know, so you can imagine 
a couple of different scenarios. One is like there's more transactions. They're paying smaller fees relative to if those had been L1 transactions, but because there uh, are so many more transactions, the miners end up making more money um, from that block. Another scenario you can imagine is that the fee, the fees per transaction or the, you know, the cost per transaction stays the same as your current, um, average, you know, cost of a transaction in a block, but because you can fit so many more transactions in a block, the miners are just making, you know, even more money. So, you know, if, if the cost per transaction is the same as like today, and you can fit a hundred times more transactions that implies a hundred times more fee revenue from the transactions that are getting confirmed in that block. Um, and then there's another scenario, which is, I think maybe, you know, the most interesting to imagine is that validity rollups enable new kinds of use cases that attract people who on net are going to pay more per transaction than they do today. And so at, you know, in that scenario, you have, you know, your, your average cost per transaction increasing and you're fitting more transactions in a block. And so, you know, you, you, you're, you're kind of stacking these multipliers on top of each other. On top of that, you have. Yeah, just like you can build more protocols on top of validity rollups that are also paying fees, which ultimately push up the the cost of getting a rollup transaction confirmed, which you know ends up in more revenue for for miners on layer one. So I think there's there's a whole bunch of potential here for making Bitcoin more valuable and also increasing utility for users and utility or, or revenues for miners. Totally. Yeah. I think the, the revenue part is really interesting there. And I'm wondering with the amount of Bitcoin miners now in North America, if this is going to be like a more mainstream conversation as it was you know, back in 2017 or 2016, uh, with like the scaling wars about like, should we increase the block size and what does that mean for minor revenue? What does that mean for miners and their ability to produce going forward? And we do see this conversation happening on a lot of other chains, right? Where Ethereum has made some trade-offs with its merge and with its uh, EIP 1559 to decrease the amount of uh, Coinbase rewards going to miners, but they're continuing with that long tail. There's still a lot of fees going to people because all these applications built on Ethereum. Bitcoin has sort of gone the other way. So I'm curious to see what it's like. Uh, also curious to get your thoughts, like, is there a silver lining or a silver bullet here because it's always like, we want to keep Bitcoin cheap, but we want to have enough rewards on Bitcoin for miners to exist and secure the chain and process transactions, so things of that nature. Do you think this solution could be that? I mean, in your report itself, it does seem to show that you believe it could be that. I do I do think that um, if we adopted validity rollups, it would, it would, it would help with minor revenue, like, and and it would also um through the process of of helping with minor revenues it would um it would it would increase the likelihood that bitcoin is sustainable as the coinbase reward gets closer to zero um sustainable maybe grows or at least you know the the um the fee revenue is is sufficient to secure the blockchain to a level that like users are most users are happy with. Um, cause that's, I think one of the, one of the concerns is that as that Coinbase reward gets closer to zero fee revenue has to pick up the slack. Otherwise, um, the, the hash rate starts going down cause mining becomes less and less profitable and users have to wait longer and longer amounts of time um, to consider their confirmed transactions to be 
uh, secure or you know secure against double spending. Um, and so the more we can do to like support that hash rate, um, the, the more secure Bitcoin is going to be, which, you know, kind of feeds back into the value of Bitcoin itself, because it, you know, if Bitcoin is secure, then people will trust it with their money. And so, you know, it's, it's a, it's this like positive, uh, feedback loop. Um, in both directions, the more secure it is, the more valuable, um, it is, uh, and the less secure it is, the less valuable it is, um, um, the less attractive it is as a value storage platform. So I think because of that potential for both, you know, more transactions, more throughput, as well as more features, being able to do more things with your coins. Um, you know, implementing new security protocols, more new privacy protocols, um, new peer to peer trade and finance protocols, um, and getting away from some of the centralized custodians and centralized, um, financial intermediaries that exist in the Bitcoin ecosystem. And we've seen, you know, cause all kinds of problems in the past, uh, you know, real, really since the Gox days, but, uh, you know, you, you know, most acutely. In the past year, we've seen billions of dollars evaporated by these centralized intermediaries. So, if, like, if we can actually build like true self-custodial, peer-to-peer um, security and, and and financial solutions on top of Bitcoin, I think that that's going to do a lot to increase the value of Bitcoin, increase utility, increase transaction volumes, and ultimately, you know, support the hash rate support minor revenues, bring, you know, support the existing miner base, bring more miners into the fold as the revenue increases and we can support more hash power. Like I think it's, it's all, uh, it's all working towards the same goal. And because validity rollups enable these things, I think without, uh, imposing like, like, um, prohibitive burdens on full nodes that could um, negatively impact the centralization and the security of the network. It seems to me like a, a really great um, solution, maybe not the silver bullet solution, um, but I think it's a, it's a big step in the right direction. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you took that question the way you did, because I do think that there's sort of two problems with any sort of scaling solution or layer two or whatever phrase you want to use, right? And and they both come down to one, is there an actual fee problem with Bitcoin? When the Coinbase reward continues to dry up, our fee is going to pick it up. Some people deny that's an issue. Some people think it is an issue. And then the second part is, are we adding economic burden to full nodes? And that's what I want to turn towards is the second, because you sort of answered the first one uh, fairly succinctly there. And let's talk about the burdens or full nodes full nodes, excuse me, that validity proofs could bring. Uh, again, I'd point people towards the great charts and graphics that you have in your research report, which we'll include in today's show notes. Uh, but there's this talk about weighted units, uh, which is basically like how we're going to weigh the economic cost of adding additional data to the Bitcoin blockchain and then how it's processed and where it's stored and sits and how, it, how that cost is spread out among users. Uh, you also get into a little bit of like the different types of transactions. And I think both those things would be worth explaining a little bit. So I'll hand it over to you uh, before we dive into like the trade-offs talk. Uh, or maybe we could just actually just dive into the trade-off talk and if you could define like the weighted units and the different types of transactions as you go along with it. Yeah, so I think you you you, you could associate two costs um, with validity rollups. One is the storage of the actual rollup data and the validity proof in the Bitcoin block. And then there's the verification cost of actually verifying the proof. I'll talk about the first one, which is related to your question about weight units. So most of your audience probably knows this, but for those who don't, um, Bitcoin doesn't actually have a block size limit um, nowadays. It ha that's a legacy term. Like maybe if you're running a pre-segwit node, 
you, you, your node still has a block size limit, but if you have a post segue, um, full node, you're, it, it's, it's enforcing, uh, a block weight limit. And so that pre segwit block size limit was the famous like one megabyte. And then the post segwit limit is now 4 million weight units. And with segwit, we got something that was called a witness discount which means that in SegWit land, any non-witness uh, data is weighed four times as heavily or counts as four weight units, whereas uh, witness data only counts as one weight unit. And so um, you're able to fit four times as much witness data in a block as you could um, non-witness data. And a lot of my throughput estimates when I was looking at like how many transactions can we fit in a Bitcoin block um, if if the entire block is filled with like a roll-up state update um, using the state-of-the-art like compression techniques to fit as many roll-up transactions as possible like, into that block. And that's how I came up with that 250,000 transactions per block number is I basically said, okay, we're going to, we're going to apply the witness discount to all of this data. And then as like, as a result of that, we can fit this many transactions per block. And I thought that this was a reasonable thing to do because rollups, uh, or rather um, layer one full nodes, don't actually have to replay or re-execute any of those transactions in the rollup. All they have to do is verify a validity proof. And the validity proof itself is a witness of those transactions, so it all it has it, it gets the witness discount because it's a witness but then i also apply the witness discount to this other data and my justification for doing that was well full nodes only have to store it they don't have to execute this um so and and storage space is like very cheap and it doesn't impose any sort of computational cost on them to have those transactions in the block like whether it's one roll up transaction uh that's in the roll-up state update or 250,000, uh, it's the same cost to the full node to, to verify the validity proof that goes along with that. So um, I thought, you know, applying the witness discount to that data was a fair or reasonable thing to do. Um, and so if we were to take advantage of Bitcoin's full 4 million weight unit limit, and to like stuff as many roll-up transactions as we could get in there, that's how you come out with that 250,000 um, transactions per block number. Um, now, a 4 million weight unit block is also 4 megabytes, which is about a meg and a half bigger than the biggest Bitcoin block that's ever been mined to date. I think the I think the the record is like 2.77 megabytes or something like that. So it is bigger than like your average Bitcoin block today. Um, but I think it's a the the cost to store the full nodes is like the bandwidth cost of like relaying those blocks uh, with four megabytes versus two and a half 2.7 megabytes of data. And then also the storage cost of storing four megabytes of data versus 2.7 megabytes of data. But they're not executing, you know, four megabytes worth of transactions as they would if it was a four megabyte block filled with layer one transactions. All they're doing is verifying a single validity proof. So those are like the trade-offs. I think is a reasonable trade-off. I also think that it's it's totally valid to have a debate about this if somebody wants to, you know, object and say, you know, that's cheating. It's four megabytes. You know, that's too much. Whatever. Like we can have that conversation. Um, 
but uh, but that that is the trade off. Um, and then when it comes to the verification costs, I mentioned, you know, no matter how many roll up transactions, which is actually like the transactions that are occurring on the roll up, happen for each roll up state update, you verify a single validity proof, and. Uh, verifying a single validity proof takes like a few milliseconds. Um, it's not significantly different than in time than verifying a Bitcoin signature, like a signature on a, a, a Bitcoin address uh, or a Bitcoin transaction. Um, but you can imagine an attack block that is stuffed full of validity roll-up transactions. Depending on the size of these validity proofs, um, some validity proofs can be as small as like uh, a kilobyte. Some are like 55 or 100 kilobytes. It just depends on the cryptography that you're using. Um, so you can fit more or less of these in a block depending on on which proof system you're using. Um, but you know you you would basically have like however many proofs you can fit in the block multiplied by the amount of time that it takes you to validate those proofs, and that will give you like your computational cost to in, you know mining that block basically or 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 including that block in in your blockchain um and the attack block scenario would basically be a miner stuffs their block full of these validity proofs and then broadcasts it and what you don't want to have happen is that when they broadcast this um it slows down a bunch of full nodes and um, or other miners, rather, it, it would slow down other miners because it's taking them a long time to like verify all of these proofs. And while they're working on verifying all of these proofs, that attack miner is already working on the next block, right? Um, so if like if that kind of scenario was to happen, that would centralize mining because now the miners who can quickly, uh, produce these blocks and then broadcast them and then build on top of them, kind of get the lion's share of mining rewards and everybody else kind of falls behind because it's taking them so long to validate all of these proofs. Um, based on the calculations that I did, um, and I include some of the numbers in the paper, even if you stuff a block full of like the smallest proofs that we know of, um, that would support validity rollups. Um, the time to verify a block is is really not significantly different than the time to verify a Bitcoin block today. And so I don't think the, the verification cost is, is really a concern. Um, I kind of like added all of that you know, preamble about it um, just to point out that there is a potential problem there. But when I looked into it, um, my personal opinion is that it's not really a problem. Again, People, you know, are free to disagree, and I'm happy to have that conversation. But, um, yeah, that's that's kind of you know that's the conclusion I've come to right now. No stone left unturned. Love that. Let's talk about the uh, cost for full nodes in terms of storage of data, though, because uh, that's an interesting thought. I mean, just you laid out the computation and like that bandwidth, like sending Bitcoin blocks places, and that seems pretty mute. But I know that there's a lot of people out there who don't want to see Bitcoins. Uh, the cost of running a full node increase at all. They don't want any more storage costs. You know, that's against a lot of different altcoin ethos. I mean, I saw a video of Vitalik this morning actually talking on the Bankless show about how in 2032, you'll have like millibytes of data streaming to your Ethereum full node on your phone every second. Bitcoin is like, no, we don't want that at all. We want the lowest storage cost as possible. Uh, what are your concerns from that camp that's saying like, this is not worth it. Uh, it's not worth adding more storage to a Bitcoin full node? I think there are a few different ways to look at this. One is um, the the block weight limit is is already for 
million weight units. And the numbers that I'm using in my estimates here are not changing that limit. So it's working within the limits that are already set by the protocol. I think if people want to uh, limit that further, that is, uh, I think, an interesting conversation and we can have that conversation. Um, but it's worth pointing out like that it is already technically possible to build a, a four megabyte block. It's, it would be very unusual, it would be a very unusual block, but it's, it is a, a, a possible technical possibility according to Bitcoin's consensus rules. Um, but like, you know, maybe a more politically correct answer would be, well, we can, we can limit the amount of data that could go into the rollup block. So, you know, we could say enable validity rollups and just not allow them to get, you know, to get to 4 million weight units, we can say 2 million weight units can be used by rollups and then rollup blocks wouldn't get any bigger than two megabytes, um, at least with just accounting for the rollup data. Um, and so in, in that case, um, I think that might address some of those concerns. You get the trade off that you're you're not throughput maxing, right? You're 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 cutting down some of those throughput um, increases by a proportional amount. Like you you would have it in that case. So instead of a two hundred and fifty thousand transactions, we're talking about one hundred twenty five thousand transactions as your like theoretical maximum limit. And, uh, you know, maybe that's a, maybe that's a fair trade-off. So, um, uh, I think, I think personally, I think storage is very cheap. It's probably the cheapest resource, uh, that is used by, uh, a full node. And so I wouldn't mind having blocks on average be like a megabyte or a megabyte and a half bigger. Um, but I'm just one guy, you know, one, one home node runner uh with his own opinions and you know it's it's a political question at the end of the day so i think it's worth running the numbers seeing what that actually means in terms of you know actual cost increases in in sats or you know, whatever dollar uh, fiat currency terms uh per year um and saying you know just trying to make a, a rough kind of decision of like is that increase worth it. I don't know how much of a conversation like that there was around SegWit. SegWit more than doubled the uh the limit of uh data that you could fit in a in a Bitcoin block. Um but there was, you know, plenty of discussion around the block size limit and scaling and whatnot around the time. So maybe it was all kind of like one big congealed conversation. But uh, you know, it is worth pointing out that we have as a community looked at the limit and said okay, we can like double it or even more than double it. And that's an appro like, that's an acceptable thing to do. Um, and you know, here I'm saying like, we could make it the block size limit, like 30 to 50% bigger and get, you know, like a hundred X more transactions or, you know, thereabouts. Um, and you know, whether, whether the community ends up deeming that acceptable or not, you know, it's, it'll be a process of debate and the del deliberation and weighing the trade-offs, you know, but I would just be happy to get validity rollups, uh, in any, in any form, uh, really, I think most of the throughput increases are going to come from protocols that get built on top of validity proofs, uh, or validity rollups, um, and so whether it's a hundred you know, hundred thousand transactions per rollup block or 250,000 transactions, I think, you know, the more, the better, but like, you're not, you know, you're never going to get billions of, you know, transactions, uh, per block or something like that, which would be needed to support like everybody. So there's going to be a trade-off at some point where we're like, all right, we can't, we literally just can't fit more people onto like full trustless, you know, layer one security model, um, we have to make some kind of trade-offs. And so, 
you know, I don't, I don't want the like block size limit to be a sticking point or like the focus, the focal point of the debate. Cause it's, I think it's probably, uh, yeah, like not, not the biggest, not the biggest concern when it comes to the, this protocol. Yeah. Especially with the cost of storage going down so quickly year over year. Uh, that's a great place to transition to our last part of the conversation, which is like the different scaling solutions that are out there. And you've mentioned a few, we've talked about them on the show already, like lightning is one, uh, we have Starkware is working on some ideas for bringing a zero knowledge proofs to Bitcoin. Uh, we have things like RSK, we have things like drive chain, which we just had a recent podcast about, uh, there's things like Fediment and like Chami and eCash sort of ideas. There's things like, uh, liquid network or the federated side chain. There's lots of ideas out there. I mean, there's even the idea that maybe we don't need to do anything to Bitcoin and Bitcoin will just be this base layer and will just be used for moving large amounts of money and we'll continue to use dollars and not that many people will be onboarded onto the Bitcoin main chain. I want to get your thoughts as a researcher and as a proponent of validity proofs on what the future for this looks like or what the future should look like for scaling Bitcoin. Uh, just like your unabashed opinion on uh, what the future should look like for this because there's a lot of different opinions out there uh, and no one seems to be right. I mean, everything has a trade-off. Yeah, trade-offs abound and even for validity rollups, like I said, you know, if they're not a silver bullet, they have their own, you know, transaction throughput limits and and those limits are nowhere near like what you would need to support, you know, every financial transaction or even payment transaction that happens in the world on a daily basis. So at some point along Bitcoin's scaling journey, there's going to be an inevitable like hard cap where you're like, okay, we, we literally can't support more people uh, with this like trustless self custodial peer to peer security model um, uh, without harming Bitcoin decentralization and security. Um, and so we need to uh, loosen our uh, standards uh, uh, around the trust model to something like, say, a federation or a side chain or um, this class of protocols that I look at in the appendix of my report called that I call validi validia chains. Um, and I think that um, like having what what is what is more important than when it comes to, I think, the Bitcoin developer community and the Bitcoin community at large, when you're thinking about consensus changes to Bitcoin, I think rather than like betting it all on a particular horse and saying like, this is the one that's going to solve all of our problems, um, I think it's better if we try to um, like expand the range of options that is available and let the market find what works best. Um, you know, and, and this might even be more nuanced to say like, you know, what works best in a given use case, like maybe for certain use cases, side chains are better. And for other use cases, lightning is better. And for still other use cases, like federated mints might be better. Um, like having all of those options available. I think is the best way to go because um, uh, it gives Bitcoin users more freedom and flexibility to do what works for them. And what validity rollups unlock is like this new class of protocols that has stronger trust models than any like off-chain protocol that you could build on Bitcoin today. So I talked at the beginning about how validity rollups themselves have a security model that is equal to layer one Bitcoin transactions. That doesn't apply to side chains. It doesn't apply to even lightning. Um, and it's, it certainly doesn't apply to the centralized or federated, um, protocols that people have been, um, building. And, you know, that's not a knock on these other protocols. Again, I think different trade-offs make more or less sense in, in different use cases. But like having the option to say, I want to get the benefits of this new roll up or whatever, 
without having to give up the layer one self-custodial security model, I think is a, like a valuable option to have. And then with Validia chains, which are very similar to rollups in that they use validity proofs to build a secure bridge. And they also inherit the, um, the double spend security from, uh, the layer that, um, they're built on top of their parent chain. Um, you get this interesting security model where, uh, with Validia chains, the data of the rollup is stored off chain. So with a rollup, the data about transactions that are happening on the rollup are stored in the layer one Bitcoin block. Whereas with Validia chains, that data is actually stored off chain. And the question then becomes like, how is that data secured? Um, who is protecting the data and making sure that it's available? Um, because users need that data to be able to produce the validity proofs and get their coins out of the system. If the data disappears, then the coins that have been uh, deposited into the Validia chain or transferred into the Validia chain uh, could become frozen. The important thing here though, is that they can be froze. The coins can be frozen, but not stolen because you still need to be able to produce a validity proof that proves that you own the coins on this other Validia chain in order to get the coins back out and onto the parent chain, either, you know, a roll up or directly back to, to Bitcoin layer one. Um, this is in contrast to systems like federated mints or side chains, uh, the federated side chains or even drive chains that exist today, where third parties can freeze coins and steal coins. So I think having this new option with Validia chains where third part, you know, the third party that you're trusting can only freeze the coins, but not steal the coins. Like that's, I think an interesting new security model and users should have the freedom to like opt into that security model instead of having to trust a third party who can both freeze and steal their coins. Um, and so for me, it's about optionality and, um, and, and I think by having this, this pluralistic ecosystem of, of, of many different, the, the, you know, this whole spectrum of different security models available, um, greatly increases the likelihood that we are able to support the, the, the largest number of use cases and, and, uh, users as Bitcoin scales from, you know, 10 million users to hundred million users to a billion users and, and beyond. Yeah. One thing I want to follow up on there is it, the difficulty with optionality in public engineering, which I think Bitcoin really is, is a public engineering project at this point is that you don't always get what you want, right? Because you're going to hit real limitations. So I would love to get a bridge from my house over to where I work during the day, but they're not going to make that just for me. Right. So like how do Bitcoin designers, the community, core developers, miners, researchers, when we're looking at this, all these things to make a decision on trade-offs, the point being that lightning was one decision, right? And people have really rallied around it. And there's some other great ideas out there, but most people don't want them. And it seems the community only has a stomach for on-chain and lightning at this point. So how do we get to a world where there's lots of optionality and choices with how we're going to spend our Bitcoin? Well, we do see, you know, an emerging effort around federated mints. Um, we see people uh, experimenting with the state chains, uh, with like Mercury Wallet. We see um, about as much Bitcoin as is currently locked up in Lightning. I know it's not an apples to apples comparison, but you know, it's a, it's still it's a significant amount of Bitcoin, basically thousands and thousands of Bitcoin that's locked up in uh, centralized or federated bridges to other blockchains, such as liquid rootstock, or even the altcoin bridges like WBTC, TBTC, and so on. Um, and I think that shows some appetite for these other kinds of, of models. And I think part of the validity rollup thesis is what if we could get something that is like between 
Bitcoin as it exists today and these other chains where we can support a lot of the same use cases as these other chains or these other protocols, but in a way that's trustless, where you don't have to trust the federation, you don't have to trust a centralized custodian, um, and uh, you know you don't have this inefficient over collateralized model like you see with TBTC. I think it seems to me like a no brainer because we already see we already see the evidence that people do want to use these their Bitcoin in these other ways. And the validity roll-up thesis is just, what if people could use their Bitcoin in these other ways, but it's trustless? And I think that's like, that certainly like compatible with the Bitcoin ethos. I think it's within the, you know, the spirit of the protocol and the community to like, take that emergent behavior that's happening and say, can we make that more secure? Can we make that closer to Bitcoin L1, both in terms of security as well as incentive compatibility? Um, because you know validity rollups are going to be paying fees to Bitcoin miners. Um, you know, to me, it it, it seems like a, a great fit, and I think the more people that learn about it and actually dig into the research and like look at these, you know, the way that people are actually using their Bitcoin out there. I think they'll see like there is a lot of evidence that this is something that the community would support. It's something that if we if we added this change to Bitcoin, people would actually use it. It's not just going to, you know, get in and then like nobody ever builds a roll up. Like I think it would be something that would be a really big, uh, really valuable um addition to Bitcoin. And I think there's a lot of evidence to support that. John, I want to thank you so much for your time uh, joining the, the Mining Pod today. Where can people find your work, your research, and your Twitter? Yeah, so the report that we've been talking about is at bitcoinrollups.org. And um, you can follow along with other research and opinions that I write about Bitcoin on my website, lightco.in, L-I-G-H-T-C-O dot I-N. And my Twitter is at Litecoin, L-I-G-H-T-C-O-I-N. Yes, Litecoin with a G and an H, not with just a T. Uh, John, thank you again so much for joining the podcast. Hopefully speak again with you soon. Yeah, thanks again for having me.